Oftentimes, something very simple can say a lot more than you would expect at first glance. Why exactly are we focusing on these few seconds? This is footage from a protest in Seattle, Washington in May of 2020. In response to the deaths of Ahmaud Arbery, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and countless others. Out of all their killers, only the murderers of George Floyd have been arrested as of this recording. The reason why we show this footage on repeat, for right now, is so that you may understand the moment in which police opened fire on innocent protesters with tear gas and rubber bullets. As you can already tell, the moment police escalate is the minute a protester holds up a pink umbrella to further protect themselves from the onslaught. Almost in lockstep, the police move forward after this, as soon as they see this brightly colored object. We do not claim to know why events happened in this sequence, but it serves as a good entry point into an aspect of policing and general right-wing sentiment that is often not discussed in the public sphere. It serves as an opportunity to further educate, to the best of our ability, about the various aspects that makes up our current political landscape, and to explain how everything, from the clothes we wear to the water we drink, has a political context. It's the aesthetic of police, paramilitary forces and right-wing hate groups and white nationalist organizations shows an absence of any colors other than blue, black, and white. The infamous thin blue line that has become the symbol of white supremacy and calls for the police to be immune from the law altogether is probably the most succinct distillation of this philosophy in action. All of these choices and the sorts of outfits we see military police wearing as they terrorize innocent civilians are made to invoke perpetual war first utilized against the citizens of other countries in numerous proxy wars, now turned back against our own American people. Of course, this is not to say that people of color and black and indigenous communities in particular were not subjected to police violence before this aesthetic change, but that such efforts have intensified the more police have been funded by military surplus budgets and equipment. That describes the current predominantly white police worship to a T. This inaccurate belief that police are the last man standing towards criminal elements that commit crimes for fun and not out of financial desperation in a vastly unequal society. The vast majority of white Americans who still support police after these latest outbursts of violence tend to view police in the vein of cowboys. After the sheer amount of media portraying them as a universal good, the only thing between the public and lawlessness even as every statistic we have shows the exact opposite, even with the terabytes of data showing otherwise, this is still a deeply entrenched belief in an institution which has been around for less than 200 years, even as it was preceded by centuries more of mistreatment of black, brown, and indigenous people. The ultimate takeaway we can find about these aesthetic choices is not just its application in law enforcement agencies, but in the way that it becomes a consumer choice in its own right. This lack of color, the militarized appearance, all of it featuring mostly older white men playing at being children still, getting to play cowboy well into middle age and beyond. The talk of such dehumanizing tropes like rioters and looters goes hand in hand with the appearance, meant as a physical threat to all who see it. This is why we see the appearance of white nationalist groups defending, of all places, corporate entities like Hobby Lobby instead of historically significant landmarks. When they do defend landmarks, the only ones defended are those noted for histories of association with the Confederacy and figures like Eddie Carmack and Frank Rizzo, noted for their attacks on black bodies and black movements, making claims of protecting heritage and history, only for them in particular. Is that why a pink umbrella is what made them escalate? Confronted with a color outside of their rigid definition, from a group of people they have done everything in their power to dehumanize, in their actions, and in their rhetoric? A sign of vulnerability. Someone protecting themselves from further harm, especially after what we know about how a white conservative views anything outside their rigid viewpoint of the world. People as property, human capital stock. We don't have, our capital stock hasn't been destroyed. Our human capital stock uh, is uh, ready to get back to work. And so that there are lots of reasons to believe that we can get going way faster. Financial value above everything else. Everything in its proper place. Only two ways to consider a person. No nuance. No different kind of interpretation. It's something to keep in mind in our own daily existences. It's not to say that the main goal of such a dialogue is to try to reason with those who mean us harm. Such measures are counterproductive at best and actively harmful to those most impacted at worst. 
but to instead make sure we are furthering our own support of the most marginalized subcategories within already marginalized peoples. Protecting those who are queer and or trans, those with disabilities and chronic illnesses, sex workers, every single range of experience a person can be. And how we know that the person with the pink umbrella is one of those people. Someone dedicated to making this country the place we've pretended it's been since 1776. Tracing back to a history of American slavery beginning in 1619. A cycle of settler colonization tracing back to 1492. In the hopes of America actually being what we've pretended it is. In the hopes of thousands, if not millions of anonymous heroes, civilly disobeying in the name of what is right. In the name of vibrancy and nuance and interpretation.